for a word from God? Yes. All right, if you are, then let's come in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody stretch your hands in the air and say, today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion because I am blessed. I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you would allow me, let me preach to you in the next few minutes on the subject of significance. One more time, say significance. Let me give you our one big message for today. God is repairing your walls. God is repairing your walls. Now, you're not going to understand that right now, but I promise you will by the end of the talk. God is repairing your walls. Let me, let me speak to you a few moments about, about job security, all right? A hypothetical question to all of you. Suppose that you were offered a job, a job that will pay you 500000 a month. Sounds good, right? All you got to do is test cars in a well-known car manufacturing plant. You, you get good medical benefits, good dental benefits for you and your entire family. Would you be interested? Yes? You'd be crazy not to say yes, right? It's a lot of money. But there's a catch. Every day you got to put on this yellow suit, lie down on the ground, and they will test the cars by rolling it over you. In other words, you're going to be a, a human speed bump. Would you still be interested? Serioso? For 500000 I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, if some hands still went up because that's, that's the truth. It's a lot of money. Let me talk to you about financial security. Financial security is one of the most intriguing forces in the planet. People will work for any company that pays them well enough. Even if it means that the work hours are so, so toxic. Even if the culture is so depressing that every day you feel like you're, 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 you're going to hell. You would still work for that company. Why? Because of, of financial security. In fact, some of the people that I know, a lot of people, when they look for work, the first thing that they will always look for is what kind of company, what company will pay me the best salary and the best benefits? Why? Again, because of security. I got nothing wrong about security. It's an important thing that you need to have in your life. Except that security will not give you long-term happiness. I have a friend who has been working for the same company for 10 years. And every time, I'm not kidding, every time I see him, he tells me something negative about his company. Whether it's the people he works with, whether it's the, it's the long work hours, always something to complain about. And yet he has stayed in that company for over many years. Why? Because he says he can't afford to quit his job because he needs the money. He needs the benefits for his family. Basically, he needs the security. Allow me to teach you something that is, if not more important, something equally important than security. May I? It's called significance. Everybody say significance. Significance. I know that security is important. You need financial security in your life. But you also need significance. See, security can get you to stay in a company for years, just like my friend. But only significance can get you to feel satisfied in that company. Do you understand what I'm saying? But here's the thing. When you look at work, imagine the work that you're doing. Try to imagine it now. The first thing that always pops into your head is, is security, right? Because hey, your job pays for your, for your bill. It pays for your utilities. It pays for your mortgage. It pays for your kids' tuition and allowance. That's the truth, right? So the, what happens is that you put aside significance. Kahit hindi na hindi importante. Significance is sacrificed. Significance becomes a second option. Here's the honest truth, my friends. You don't want to wake up one day and realize that all you've been doing in your life is chasing money. 
and chasing, chasing security. And then you realize that because you've been doing that, you didn't have time to chase anything else that was more important. Don't just chase money, but chase some meaning as well. Don't just chase security, but chase significant as well. Because it's even, it's important in your life. Could you elbow the person next to you to make sure that they're, they're listening? Say, chase significance. You need some significance. In fact, Paul said something so powerful and so important in Philippians 4.19. He says, and my God will meet all your needs. Everybody say, all your needs. According to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs. When you say the word needs, the first thing that usually pops into our heads is, you know, provision. Because we need money to buy things. We need money to pay for everything. We need money to get things, right? That's what I love about what Paul says. He didn't use the word need. He said needs. It's plural. Because he understood that you have more than just one need. How many of you have more than just one need? You need something more than just money, right? Some of you, you have money, but you don't have rest. Some of you, you have rest, but you don't have peace. Some of you, you have peace, but you don't have love. Can I get an amen? God doesn't just want to give you one thing. God wants to give you everything. Amen? My God shall supply all your needs whatever it is that you need security financial security my dear friends it's just one side of your wall in your life you got a lot of other walls that need your attention too and that's what we're going to talk about today what what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to go deep deep into theology deep into biblical history deep into psychology deep into spirituality so if is that okay okay tap somebody beside you and say hang on we're going to go deep. We're going to dive. You better hang on. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say this. You know, because we're, we're going to go to Nehemiah, the book in the Bible called Nehemiah. We're going to go there. But before there, just going to give a little background. One of my theology professors said this. He said that many Christians think more like Plato than like Christ. Brother Bo, who is Plato? Let me uh, tell you who he is. Plato is the father of Platito. <laughs> that, that's what happens when you lack sleep. <laughs> Plato is an ancient Greek philosopher that was born before Christ. And of course, you know, it's, it's actually totally simplistic to summarize his whole teaching. But what happened was that his teaching, his, his philosophy, his thinking shaped the people and the thinking of that particular time. And you know what? Christians, I guess, didn't have much choice. They had to engage the culture. They had to engage society. So they had to think in the same way. But you see, what's the difference between Plato and Jesus? So here's the thing. I, again, um, uh, forgive me for, for this, this, the simplistic approach that I'm going to take. But Plato is dualistic and Jesus is holistic. For Plato, the body is evil, the soul is good. Are you listening to me? So that, that's it. Everybody say dualistic. Tomorrow when you go to work, you know, just tell your office mate and impress the person and say, you're so dualistic. <laughs> dualistic means, you know, that, that's, that's the whole thing of Plato. Your soul is good, but anything physical is bad. But in Jesus, the Bible, it doesn't think that way. Can I, can I go to the book of Genesis? May I? Book of Genesis, let's, let, let's go there. Very, very important. Where, where you have in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, God looked at everything He had made and found it very good. The whole universe, God says, it's good. 
Not just the spirit, not just the soul. Are you listening? So that's the approach. And, but this dualistic thinking has crept into our faith. Can I give an example? I've, I've shared this example before. But for the longest time, a lot of people think or thought that priests and nuns are holier and more pleasing to God than the rest of us. Why? Oh, because priests and nuns, they're focused totally on God. They're, they're, they're there saving souls. We were selling soap. We're, you know, makamundo. We're, we're of the world. We're cashiers and accountants and farmers and salespeople and entrepreneurs. Hey, there's another reason why we think priests and nuns are, you know, more pleasing to God. They're, they don't have sex. We, we're married, you know, we have sex, what, once a week, twice a week. Some married couples, once a year. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have sex, and sex is, yuck, you know, dirty. But priests and nuns, none, you know, they're, they're focused on God. That's why they're holier. That is more Plato than Christ. Because again, you look at Scripture, you, and even the catechism of the Catholic Church will tell you that sex is a gift from God. He invented it. Hello? Must be good. Must be wonderful. Can I go personal on you on this? Can I? I enjoy sex. <gasps> Oh my gosh, Bo, don't say that. They're children. <laughs> but it's true. You know, some people think that, you know, you're supposed to tolerate sex, you know, just have kids. That, that's the whole purpose. No, there, there's a unitive factor. In, in theology, we, we study about that, there's, that God gave sex so that married couples can, can have a way of expressing their unity and their love for one another. My, my, person, my, my wife and I just want you to know that we have fantastic sex life. We do. I, I can say that to you. At the start, it was not. At the start, we were awkward. We didn't know. We, we were clumsy. But you know, this is the irony. Just, just between you and me, okay? Just secret. The older we got, the more we loved each other, the more we enjoyed our sex. It's true. And can I say this out loud now? Announcement! Monogamous married sex is the best sex in the world. I'm telling you, whatever they show in pornography and whatever they, they show in, in, in you know, the adultery and they say that's, that's the best sex in the world. <laughs> Thanks. That's a nice joke. You talk to a married couple that really love each other and that enjoy their sex together and they will tell you this. This talk is not about sex. Can we just go back to the topic? <laughs> Here's the point I want to drive at. That th that's my background. That I believe when people say and in their minds, Priests are holier than plumbers, and nuns are holier than nannies, and, and, and missionaries are holier than, than mechanics. That's more Plato than Christ. Any kind of work that you do is holy. Any work. Ask me why. I shared this last week. Because not of the work, but because of the worker. You are holy. God created you holy. And so any work that comes out from you, whether you're a manager, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a, a call center agent, any work that comes out becomes holy if you do it in the name of God, if you do it in love, if you do it because you want to declare the glory of God. I'm going to read you a few more scripture passages from before we go to Nehemiah. Um, from, from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, um, you have Jesus teaching us the Our Father. And it says, it says this. You know, a, a lot of people think this. That your, the whole purpose of life 
Everybody say, I'm listening. I want you to get this. This is very important. What is the goal of life? Is the goal of life to go to heaven? A lot of people will say yes, right? Can I nuance that a bit? In one sense, it's true. It's another, in another sense, no, it's not true. When Jesus taught the Our Father, He said this, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The goal of life is not just to go to heaven. I'm sorry. The goal of your life is to bring heaven down on earth. Especially for those who are suffering in hell right now. There's so much pain out there. Yes or no? There's so much suffering out there. There's so much depression and loneliness and suicide out there. You're needed out there. You're needed to bring the love of God out there. That's the purpose of life. It's not to escape this world. God does not have an evacuation plan to heaven. God has a transformation plan for earth. And you're included. You're part of that. Can I go to history? Now, I told you we're going to go deep. And when I go deep, you know that I'm going to go deep because I bring out my toys. My, I, have, I have two little boys that grew up. They're no longer little. And so they left all the toys in this one room. So those are, my, those are all my props. Okay. 800 BC, Solomon, King Solomon, built the temple of, uh, of, of uh, Jerusalem. Doesn't look like a temple, but never mind. And then he built walls around the city of Jerusalem. And this is what happened. Now, these were the Jews. Sorry. I was trying to look for better toys, but never mind. 300 years later, everybody say, 300 years later. Babylon comes. Babylon. Babylon. Superpower. Dun, 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 dun. Destroys the temple. Destroys the walls. Conquers Jerusalem. And then he exiles the Jews from Jerusalem, brings them to Babylon. And that's what they did during that time. When you know, conquer land, you gather the, the citizens of that place, make them prisoners, exile them. And so they lived in Babylon for 70 years. Do you know what happened next? Ask me what happened. What? Another country comes, Persia, and, and overcomes and conquers Babylon. How many of you know this? That if you're a superpower now, you're not going to be a superpower tomorrow. You know, cycles change. You know, there, there is a, when I was a kid, we watched the show. Gulong ng Palat. Marian de la Riva. Ronald Corvu. That's how old I am. Never mind. I don't know why I remember, remember that. But, but you know, that, that, that's life. You know, you're on top today. You're down later on. And that's what happens. And so when Persia, by the way, uh, Babylon, it's, it's, it's uh, now in present day Iraq. And Persia, Iran. They were superpowers before. Whatever the U.S. is now, that was their position before. That's crazy. But anyway, so Persia conquers Babylon. And Persia says to the Jews, go home. You can go home now. So the Jews went home. And you know what they did? We're going to talk about this next week. They rebuilt the temple. That's the first thing they did. They built the temple. And then as the years went by, but the, but the walls were still down in shambles. This is where Nehemiah comes. Nehemiah was still here. He was actually working for the king of Persia, the emperor of Persia. And he was a cupbearer. We're going to read what happened. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Here it is. Nehemiah chapter 1, it says, verse 3 and 4. They also told me, Nehemiah speaking, that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down and that the gates had not been restored since the time they were burned. When I heard all this, I sat down and wept. Can everybody say that? I sat down and wept. For several days I mourned. Can you say that? Several days. I mourned and did not eat. I prayed to God. Do you know what happened to Nehemiah? Ask me what? He received a burden from God. 
God sometimes, many times, gives us the privilege, everybody say privilege, of carrying His burden in our hearts. He passes on the burden to our hearts. Nehemiah had a burden to build the walls of Jerusalem. My dear friends, I've seen that happen in my life. I've seen that happen in other people's lives. 20 years ago, I had a burden. I was there serving God, giving my life to God, but then I had friends who were with me, fellow missionaries who loved God, prayerful, good, kind, wonderful human beings, but they were in financial troubles. They, have, they were buried in debt. They could not meet their, their bills. And my heart was just breaking for them. And I knew this, this was, you know, I was like Nehemiah. I, I was there wrestling with God and saying, God, how, how, how can this happen? My friends are, 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 are wonderful people. And look at them. They're, they're, Lord, they're, they're full-time missionaries. But look at them. They're, they're, they're so buried in debt. They, they, they don't know what to do. I was crying out to God. I knew it was a burden. And that's why I started, now you know, why I started preaching about financial literacy and I gave you know I wrote books on that why I built the truly rich club and we've been doing it and we've been able to help thousands of people it all started with God giving me a burden are you listening to me I'll tell you another example Jodine Sola good friend of mine you know you know what was Jodine's work before he was with me in light of Jesus and he would take care of the speakers he, he was not a speaker he would take care of the sound speakers, the, the audio speakers. He, he, would, he would coil the wires, you know, and he would, after the prayer meeting, he'll be the one to put it back to the office. That was his work. But every day after work, he'll go to the streets, sit on the sidewalk, and play with the street children, and talk to the street children, and tell them about God's love. And one day, he just came up to me and he said, Brother Bo, I don't know why, but I have this burden in my heart for the street kids. <laughs> and I said, you go. God is sending you. You go. Today, Jodine Sola has a ministry called He Cares Street Kids Foundation, feeding hundreds of street kids, sending hundreds of street kids to school. And, and we, we're partners now. We support that ministry. Light of Jesus supports He Cares Foundation all the way. We, we, we love what he's doing. It started with what? A burden. My dear friend, can I ask you this question? Is God giving you a burden in your heart? Is He passing on His burden to your heart? It will be the start of something powerful. Is God disturbing you today? You know that God, He comforts the disturbed, but He also disturbs the comfortable. What, this, the other thing, that this is what happened to Nehemiah. So, so He starts... He says, chapter 2, verse 4 and 6, I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the emperor, because he was working for the king of Persia as a cupbearer, if your majesty is pleased with me and is willing to grant my request, let me go to the land of Judah, to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild the city. The emperor with the empress sitting at his side approved my request. The beautiful thing about Nehemiah was that he was the cupbearer. He was able to ask for resources from the king because he was serving the king. And the king said, go. And he sent re resources to Nehemiah. He became the, Nehemiah became the governor of Jerusalem when he went back. But here's my point, and I want you to listen carefully to this. Nehemiah saw that his position was no accident. It was a divine appointment. And he used that. And I speak God's word to you today. One more time. Everybody say, I'm listening. I'm listening. You are in your job. You are in your position. You are in that company. You are in that school. You are in that neighborhood. You are there, not by accident. You're there by divine appointment. God wants you to be there. He's going to use you to build His kingdom in that part of the world. But you've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You've got to say, Lord, why am I here? Why did you put me in this position? Why, why with this group of people? Why? 
He has a purpose. Touch somebody beside you and say, He has a purpose. So Nehemiah goes back here and he starts rebuilding the temple. Now the beautiful thing about Nehemiah is this. Do you know the original meaning of his name? Ask me what? Comforter. That's what his name means. And do you know there's someone else in the Bible that's called Comforter? The Gospel of John. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter. And many spiritual writers down through the centuries, when they read the book of Nehemiah, they realize that Nehemiah is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And here's the beautiful thing. The Holy Spirit comes back into the city of, 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 of our lives and starts rebuilding our walls. My dear friend, here's my big message for the entire talk. The temple was already built. The temple is a symbol of our spiritual life. The walls, they're a representation of our secular life. But God is interested not only on your spiritual life, He is interested in your secular life as well. Ask me why. Because a well-ordered secular life has an effect on your spiritual life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Without an ordered secular life, your spiritual life will be affected. What, is your, what are the walls? There are five boundaries, fences, walls that God wants to rebuild in your life. The first is your emotional life. Say emotional life. You cannot be spiritually mature if you're not emotionally mature. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? A, a lot of people think that, you know, oh, God is just interested in me going to church and, yeah, praying and, you know, you know being, a, you know, following, trying. No, no, that, that's your spiritual life. That's great. But He's interested also in your emotional life. Are you able to manage your emotions? My dear friends, can, can, I, can I tell you my story about this whole thing? Can I? Once upon a time, I did not love myself. Once upon a time, I thought that the spiritual life was the only thing that mattered. And to think of other areas of my life was selfishness. That's why, that's why my spiritual life was standing. Because when I was 12 years old, I came to a prayer meeting, I gave my life to God. When I was 13, I started preaching. So my spiritual life was okay in one sense, but everything else was not okay. Everything else was not standing. My emotional life, it was not standing. I did not know what to do with my negative emotions, sadness, fear, anger. I would deny them. I would reject them. I would say, no, 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 no. I had to learn. The Holy Spirit helped me. I had to learn to say to myself, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel worried. It's okay to feel angry in the presence of God. Because when you say that, it's okay, that is a powerful act of self-love. The reason why the walls are broken is because you do not love yourself. And when you do not love yourself, you allow abusive people to come in, which is the second wall, relationship. The relational boundaries. If you allow toxic people, everybody say toxic. I told you I'm going to go deep here. If you allow toxic people to come into your life because your walls are down, that's what happens. Everybody say, I'm ready. Love is always a choice. When there is no choice, it is not love. You understand me? Yes. That is abuse. When people just come in because the walls are not there. What God does is He makes you, teaches you how to love yourself. Teaches you how to protect yourself. Teaches you how to build those walls. But the beautiful thing about God is this. If you are just a person with walls, keeping, protecting yourself, that's not a life. That's not a life. The purpose of life is to love. And so here's what God does. He not only builds your walls, He also repairs 
your gates. He repairs your gates. What's the difference between a fence and a gate? A gate, my dear friends, is this. It opens up and allows people to come in. Abusive people and toxic people, you say no to them because you love yourself. But you open the gate for other people to come in so that you can love them and sacrifice your life for them. That is the meaning of life. You allow people to enter your life. You need a gate. Tell somebody beside you, you need a wall and you need a gate. And that's what God is rebuilding. He's teaching you to love yourself so that you can love other people. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? The third wall is physical boundaries. God wants you to build your... I, I meet a lot of religious people. Not maybe a lot, maybe some. Some religious people who, who are... <laughs> who treat their bodies not as a temple, but as a trash can. They do not respect their bodies. And then fourth boundary, financial. God wants you to build that important area of your life. Not for yourself only, but so that you can be a blessing to other people. How can you serve if you're buried in debt? Hello! He wants you to have financial freedom so that you can be of greater service to others. And then number five, we go back to the message of our series, vocational boundaries. He wants to bless you. Can we all stand up? Can, can I lead you into a prayer right now? He wants to bless all the areas of your life. He wants to bless your career. Again, not for yourself alone, but so that you can be a blessing to others. So that your work becomes your worship. Your, your, your profession becomes your praise. And so that, so that your occupation will become your offering to God. Are you listening to me? Are you ready to be blessed today? Are you ready to rebuild the walls, the boundaries of your life? This is my prayer that God will do it right now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lift up your hands. Say this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that you're repairing the broken fences of my life. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you that my spiritual life and my secular life are now one under the Lordship of Jesus. I follow you. I will serve you. You are the center. You are my number one.